Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to yet another interesting webinar of Steelman Pengage 4.0, the Virtual Connect. In these webinars, we are exploring a gamut of topics ranging from iron ore, coal, scrap, and steel. And we are also hearing from our esteemed speakers that what will be the demand outlook for 2023 and the expected CBAM impact on the global steel trade flows. I am Nishtha Mukherjee, your host for the webinar. Along with me, I would like to introduce you all to Ms. Sakina Rizvi, who will be co-hosting the session with me, which is on EU steel market trends and implications of CBAM on the global industry. I would also like to thank Indian Steel Association for extending their logo support for the webinar. A reminder to all the participants that will be taking all the questions towards the end of the session. So please keep your queries ready and share them on the chat box with us. Don't forget to mention your name and your company's name while you put in your queries. Our esteemed speaker, Mr. Alessandro Shamrali, Director, Market Analysis and Economic Studies, Europa, will be showing a brief overview of the market and will also be throwing a more light on the topic. Mr. Shamrali is an experienced economist who has been working for more than 15 years in the internationally oriented environments, such as research centers, international organizations, private corporate sectors, and in major Brussels-based European industry federations. Welcome to the webinar, Mr. Shamrali. So before I invite Mr. Shamrali to give his presentation, I would request Sakina to give a brief market overview on the EU steel market. Over to you, Sakina. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. While the Europe's economy grew by 3.5% in 2022, avoiding recession, industrial activities suffered significantly from high energy costs that led to a sizable contraction in steel demand in 2022. In 2023, the European steel industry will continue to feel the impact of other supply chain related issues and continued monetary tightening. WSA predicts after a fall in 2022, steel demand is expected to fall by 0.4% in 2023. Thanks, Akina, for that quick and brief uh, market overview. We now turn to our esteemed speaker for his presentation. Over to you, Mr. Shamrali. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be speaking here today. Uh, it is a pleasure, um, as anticipated by um, the kind introduction uh, that um, was given, I will be presenting the latest uh, outlook for the EU economy and industry, and particularly the steel market. And I would also um, try to provide an overview of the possible developments and, and po some possible implications of, of, of CBAM. Uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which uh, um, will start to be implemented in, in 2026. Um, most of the figures which we will find today in my presentation are also available in our latest quarterly economic and market outlook, due to which you can download for free from our website, www.eurofer.eu. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm a chief economist at Eurofer, which is the European Steel Association, which uh, gathers uh, national steel associations in Europe and also some leading companies such as ArcelorMittal, Tata Steel, Thyssen Group, and so on. Um, so I will now get started uh, and I will um, yeah, um, share my presentation uh, with you. Um, yeah. I will try to um, to make it full screen if uh, if I find the, um, the function available. Could you please put it in full screen, or because I can't I can do it from my. Um, uh, yes, you can do it from your end as well, Mr. Shamil. Oh, uh, yeah. The point um, is that. Uh, okay, now we see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was hidden. Sorry, it was hidden by uh, a toolbar. Uh, it should be should be okay now. Can you see it? Uh, not yet. 
mean, it's still on these side uh, view mode. Okay, 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 okay. We'll try to see. Um, do you want me to display it from uh, my end? Yeah, please do so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just give yeah. me a moment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, is it is it visible? Mm. Yeah, if you can please put it in full screen. Yeah, like that yeah. should be working. I, I I don't know why it's not working for my uh, for my control room. Let's say, but okay, that works. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So if you can go to the next slide. Okay, uh, this is briefly the content, uh, the structure of the presentation. So the economic outlook with forecast and latest seeding the indicators for the industry. Then we'll have an overview of uh, um, developments in the industry and in still using sectors, which are uh, actually um, so important for the steel sector because that's where steel demand comes from. And then we will have an overview of latest steel market indicators on supply and demand, so production, consumption. And then we have an overview of latest trade developments. And then we'll have a um, some slides on, on CBAM, the state of play, where we stand now in Europe with CBAM and the possible perspective. So if we get started with the next slide. Uh, we see yeah, an overview of the latest uh, macroeconomic uh, indicators. Um, so essentially, um, as has already been um, anticipated, uh, the EU has proven much more resilient than expected. So uh, the economy didn't have any recession, but not only. Uh, it achieved a growth of 3.5% in real GDP in 2022, despite the protracted impact of um, the war in Ukraine, high energy prices, particularly over the summer, uh, very, very high inflation, uh, record high inflation, and other war-related disruptions all in the supply chain, particularly for some industrial sectors. So we didn't have recession in 2022. Um, but we see some economic slowdown in the la in the last two quarters. But however, um, some let's say technical recession had been uh, foreseen for um, Q4 22 and Q1 23, 23, which however did not materialize. So we had actually no technical recession in uh, in, in Q1 2023. You see on the left hand side the latest quarter to quarter developments in real GDP in the EU and in major euro area economies and also in the US. Um, however, we had technical recession in Germany, uh, minus 0.3 percent in, in, in Q1 2023 after another slump in Q4 22, and also in the euro area, albeit marginal, almost flat growth, minus 0.1 percent. Uh, but however, the point is that um, the what in, in the EU overall there was no technical recession, and um, let's say. Uh, Q4 22 and Q1 23 were expected to be the lowest point of the economic cycle, where the um, uh, the impact of the um, above disruptions, war in Ukraine, and high energy prices were expected to be felt the most, with the biggest impact. Um, in 2023, um, all major forecasters um, see growth in real GDP in the EU 0.8 percent, um, according to. Um, according to the uh, um, according to the uh, OECD, in zero point nine percent according to the OECD in the in the euro area, one percent according to the European Commission. Um, we see zero point six percent as euro fair in our latest forecast released in May. Uh, but however, the outlook is expected to remain very very uncertain given the uh, impact of the uh, above downside factors, which are expected to persist also um for um for this year um and it also has to be it has to be highlighted that the the, the strong contribution to gdp growth in 2021 which was the year of a big economic rebound after covid uh was um, was was driven primarily by the industry whereas services remained very depressed due to restrictive measures still in place uh, in, to, in 2022, we've seen quite the opposite. So uh, the industry was very much impacted by the, the high energy prices and other war-related disruptions, whereas services uh, could display their contribution to growth almost to full potential. So 
we expect the same um, to continue to happen in 2023, so growth will be fueled primarily by, by services, uh, whereas the industry will continue to remain weak, and we'll see that later also. We go to the next slide. We have an overview of... Um, um, we have an overview of the latest uh, leading indicators. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, we go to leading indicators for the entire economy and the, yes, thank you, and the industry. Uh, these are produced by Standard & Poor. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you see the composite PMI um, output index in May 23 uh, for the overall economy and the euro area, which signals uh, another monthly expansion in May above the 50 expansion level, so 33.3 uh, in May for the fifth consecutive month. But however, on the on the right hand side, you see that manufacturing output contracted sharply, dropping at the fastest rate over the last six months. So, um, uh, contrary to what happened in the industry. Um, uh, output in the service sector has expanded at the widest, at the at, at the biggest rate since uh, uh, since January, uh, and uh, as a result, growth in the euro area as well as in the EU in Q2 2023 is expected to be positive as a result of this um, anticipation provided by leading indicators, but essentially driven by services, as we've seen. So we go to the next slide, and uh, we see. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Yes, we see uh, what is the most probably the biggest problem, the biggest concern for the economy and the industry overall, which is the rise in inflation. Uh, inflation has reached uh, during 2022 uh, highs, which were unseen since 19, 1985, peaking at 11.5% uh, in October uh, as a result of a rise in energy prices which was really unprecedented, particularly over the summer. Uh, but inflation has been easing since then quite considerably, particularly in some individual member states, in it halved in Spain, reaching uh, only uh, going down to 3.8% uh, in April 23, but remaining around very high levels uh, in, other, in other countries. Um, still on the rise again in, in April in Italy, uh, but remaining uh, at, at levels which are really, really high in historical terms. Um, moderation is expected for the coming months, but inflation will, however, remain around um, historically high levels throughout this year. Uh, the latest European Commission forecast after 9.2% in 2022 uh, see inflation uh, rate um, harmonized consumer prices at 6.7% in 2023, which is higher than the previous forecast, which was 6.4%. Then it, has, it is expected to decrease, to, to ease considerably down to 3.1% in 2024. Um, and also interestingly, and electricity inflation, um, according to um, the, the general um, slowdown in, in, in overall inflation has slowed to 13% in April 23, which remains very high, but it was um, it had gone even above 50% uh, in July 22 when, uh, uh, when uh, natural gas prices and energy prices reached their peak. Uh, and as a consequence of uh, this record high inflation, the ECB, the European Central Bank, has already raised its policy rates uh, seven times, um, up to uh, from zero to uh, three point seventy five percent. But real interest rates remain negative, um, and therefore um, other hikes are possible. Uh, during um, for the rest of this year, particularly on um, this Thursday, fifteenth uh, of of June, there will be a, a monetary policy committee in the ECB, and another hike is expected by uh, most probably um, fifty basis points. Uh, but the point is actually really that inflation has wrongly been underestimated by the ECB and other central banks. So um, the 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 point they made was that inflation was temporary. Uh, whereas it has proven not to be temporary, and uh, inflation has so far continued to erode purchasing power for households, and have continued to destroy demand for the for the industry, um, and that obviously, um, as a second consequence, inflation has inevitably triggered uh, continued monetary policy tightening uh, in in the euro area and also in in the U.S. 
um, the cost of government um, government debt service will also be higher for governments and also um, loans will be uh, will be more expensive for houses and businesses. So um, it is not clear when, as I said, when the ECB will uh, will finish its uh, its uh, monetary tightening, uh, monetary policy tightening. Uh, but it is clear that inflation has also the, already produced some serious consequences on the economy and remains a source of concern. If we go to the next slide, we see. Um, in essentially what has been uh, one of the primary source, well, most probably the primary source of the um, peak in inflation over the, over the latest months, uh, that was the um, the Dutch TTF uh, gas price index, which is the reference price for the gas market in Europe, which you saw, you see here reached the incredibly high levels in the summer of 2022 up to 342 euros per megawatt hour. And then has started to decrease dramatically uh, thanks to a combination of factors and uh, which I will um, uh, um, set out more in detail um, in, in a second. And when they went down to uh, levels which are much closer to the uh, historical long-term average, which was around 20 euros per megawatt hour. Now it was, uh, in, in, in the latest days, it was around uh, 23, 25 euros per megawatt hour. So it was a, a, a considerable decline which contributed to uh, lower inflation, but inflation has remained high, uh, even uh, when adjusted by the uh, contribution to inflation provided by energy prices. So it means that there are other inflationary pressures on the economy. But this is important that uh, it is important already that energy prices have um, gone down considerably. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, we can introduce uh, and let's say set out the major uh, the, 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 the main points uh, concerning the, the energy crisis that the, the EU, that Europe has just experienced, which was, uh, if we look at the numbers, was indeed the most severe energy shock that the EU has ever experienced. It was even more severe than the two oil shocks experienced in the 70s, in 1973 and 1979. Uh, because in 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 uh, uh, during during uh, those two oil shocks, inflation went even above twenty percent in most European member states, and the, we had we had a, a economic recessions in many member states, where whereas we we didn't have in twenty twenty two. On the contrary, the economy grew by three three point five percent. It was, and even the industrial sector was um, more resilient than expected. So why has it happened? Why the impact, uh, despite this uh, uh, most severe ever energy crisis, why, why, why was the impact lower? Well, there are basically three reasons, in my view, not only in my view, um, seems to be that, um, well, first of all, uh, uh, energy supply as as uh, as a as a first consequence of this energy crisis. Energy supply, contrary to what happened in in, in the seventies, uh, was. Uh, let's say appears to be at the moment secure so we didn't have any uh any dramatic energy shortage or we didn't have any uh, uh inability to replace the the provision of russian oil primarily in russian gas uh and and uh, together with the uh, lower impact on the economy and on inflation but why did it happen well that was because First of all, the EU has set up over the years some intervention mechanisms and some joint actions which didn't exist in the 70s as a result of much higher economic integration. The second thing is that uh, as well as in other um, advanced economies as in the US or uh, in the UK, uh, energy intensity is now much lower than in the 70s. That's to say that the sensitivity of the economy to energy shocks is lower. Uh, the, the tons of oil equivalent per unit of GDP are, are, are lower. It has decreased compared to the 70s. And then third, third point is that the, the EU has proven able to react and to respond very quickly and rather effectively with some short-term measures which have helped alleviate the consequences of the energy shock. Uh, the uh, Repower EU program has been set up and started to be implemented. Uh, gas stocks were replenished in the second half of 2022 quite successfully, and we were able to diversify energy supply and to, let's say, um, phase out from dependency on, on Russian gas, particularly for some uh, European industries, particularly for Germany and Italy. So if we go to the next slide, we can go to... 
uh, yeah, the latest industry leading indicators, which uh, show the state of the of the overall European industry. Um, so, as I said, the, the the impact of the energy crisis on the 20, in twenty twenty two was severe. Uh, but however, the industry proved resilient somewhat. But however, the contribution of the industry to growth was very low. You can see on the on the left hand side the evolution of orders from um, some of the major industrial sectors, which are also steel using sectors. So construction, mechanical engineer, automotive, that's met, uh, motor vehicles, and metal goods. So uh, you see there um, orders have been slowing constantly since. Uh, um, April of 2022, when the impact of the war in Ukraine started being felt, and then the decrease have um, become more evident in the second half of 2022, uh, particularly for um, for metal goods and for construction, which have entered uh, a, a, a technical recession. We will see it later in the second half of 2022. Uh, how, however, on the other hand, um, the evolution of, of orders for motor vehicles has been more positive, which signals some short-term rebound, some short-term improvement in automotive, and we'll see that later. But orders have been slowing down, reflecting the deterioration of the industrial outlook. And on the right-hand side, you see, very simply, uh, the evolution of industrial production in monthly data for the UN major uh, euro area economies. Um, so the key point is here that uh, in, in, in France and Germany, uh, industrial production is still lagging behind. So um, the output in manufacturing is still below pre-pandemic levels, the levels that were seen before the pandemic, whereas it has recovered um, to the levels seen before the pandemic in 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 Spain and in Italy, despite some short term uh, deterioration in Italy, which we've seen over the last two months. But however, um, in these two countries, uh, recovery was was um, recovery was seen. But however, in Germany and France, uh, um, the industrial production lags behind, particularly in Germany. Germany's uh, in Germany, the industrial sector has been impacted the most due to the the weight of the automotive sector on the on the German economy and the automotive sector. We will see it like later uh, has been most impacted than any other um, serious sectors by the multiple shocks which we've seen in latest years: COVID, supply chain issues, and war in Ukraine. So, we go to the next slide, please. We see. Um, yeah, the evolution of steel using sectors. So this is the evolution of uh, output in sectors which are actually demand, which uh, let's say uh, uh, represent the demand of steel in Europe. Uh, so what you see here in this chart is uh, the evolution of year-on-year -year growth rates in every quarter since Q1 2017 for the most important, some of the most important steel using sectors, construction, automotive, mechanical engineering, domestic appliances, and then you see the overall sweep, which is the dotted line. Sweep is the still weighted industrial production. Uh, in an actual output from um, these sectors have continued to increase in 2021 as a powerful, very sharp rebound after the COVID pandemic, when uh, the industry actually drove uh, the uh, economic recovery in Europe and industry was really the engine of the, of, of the, of the recovery. So then we had a slowdown uh, after Q2 2021, um, which has continued um, up to uh, Q4 2022, and, and uh, which is the latest figure available. Um, and some of these uh, some of these sectors even uh, went to uh, to negative territory, albeit marginally. For example, the construction sector, which has has, uh, has entered most probably a period of recession, we would see it in a second. Uh, and the outlook for 2023 remains quite uncertain and is expected to be impacted by the protracted impact of the war in Ukraine and other, uh, and the overall uncertainty of the of the economy, despite uh, uh, more stability in the in the energy prices, which is expected. It is, um, I think, quite interesting to see the um, evolution of automotive, which has rebounded um, over the last three quarters. Um, automotive had uh, rebounded at very, very low rates in 2021 after COVID. So the, we had re, we, we saw really a moderate recovery in the automotive sector, uh, and as a consequence, the um, output levels in absolute terms for the automotive sector remained very low, very, very much below uh, 2019 volumes before the pandemic. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we see uh, what it 
means uh, how we translate all these developments in annual uh, growth rates in in uh, in output for major C using sectors. Um, sweep in uh, in 2023 overall sweep grew very marginally by 0.3 percent, and growth was positive thanks to quite positive development still in the first half of, of, of last year, particularly in Q1, as a continuation of the positive trend, which was, however, slowing down already. Uh, but um, we expect, uh, uh, we expect, uh, um, yeah, we expect a growth of 0.3% in 2023, uh, after 3.1% in 2022. Uh, and um, still, we expect some positive growth in 2024, 1.3%, thanks particularly to the contribution provided by mechanical engineering uh, and uh, and also some recovery in construction. Construction is particularly interesting um, because the construction sector, which accounts for 35% of overall steel consumption, had um, grown uh, quite remarkably uh, in 2021 after the pandemic and also in 2022, 6.7% and 4.8% respectively, but is expected to um, see a recession in 2023, which is minus 1.6%. Um, this is due, um, in essence, to uh, lower um, contribution to growth from the public service, from the public sector, that is civil engineering and infrastructure, which was boosted enormously after the pandemic in 21 and 22, but also, uh, and I would say more importantly, uh, the construction sector will be affected by um, the downturn in the, in the residential housing market due to the increase of mortgage interest rates uh, as a result of monetary policy tightening. Um, the automotive sector, as I said, uh, only had a modest rebound in 21 and 22, 3.3% growth in each year. And in 2020, automotive had been impacted the most uh, by the, uh, the COVID crisis with a drop of minus 19%. Uh, uh, the reason is very simple. Uh, the automotive sector is, by definition, in Europe in particular, uh, the sector which is most exposed, most vulnerable to external shocks. It is largely export-oriented, particularly in Germany. And uh, the supply chain of the um, automotive sector is particularly complex. So the continued disruptions along the supply chain in 2021 and 22 have impacted output in the construction sector. So the, the rebound in output uh, from the loss seen in 2020 was very low. Uh, and uh, in 23, we expect uh, output in automotive also to continue to grow, but very modestly, only 1.2%, also because um, on the demand side, demand from consumers remains very uncertain due to uh, poor disposable income developments for households, due to the economic uncertainty, and due to the fact that implementation of electric vehicles in Europe is lagging behind, is very uncertain. So there are a lot of problems which, uh, let's say, delay purchase decisions uh, from consumers and also delay investment decision from car makers. So that's uh, that's in a nutshell the, the, the output. But SWIP, as I said, in a nutshell will, will grow also in, in, in very, very modestly, almost flat growth in 23 and also will grow in 2024, uh, but at, at low levels, 1.3%. If we go to the next slide, please, we we finally go to the steel sector and we have an overview of um, steel, uh, um, steel market indicators. Uh, we start here with the supply. This is the overall crude steel production, the evolution uh, in annual terms since 2008. And as expected, due to the impact of energy prices and the, the poor industrial outlook in 2022 production, um, for all crude steel dropped uh, by 10% in 2022 after the 16% rebound in 2021. Um, the, the drop in 2022 was severe, uh, almost as severe as it was, we'd seen in 2020, which was minus 12%, but the most severe drop was seen in 2009 at the time of the financial crisis when steel production dropped by 30%. And since then, if you look at the evolution of, of output um, in, in, in crude steel, the, the crude steel production has actually never recovered from the losses seen in 2009. And uh, uh, 
yeah, this is uh, this is where we stand now with the uh, um, crude production levels around uh, 140 million tons uh, below 140 million tons, which is a, a quite low figure in in in, uh, in historical terms. So um, over the entire period, the compound annual growth rate is uh, is a drop of uh, minus is minus four percent, which signals kind of long term decline in, in in steel production in the EU. We go to the next slide, then we go to demand. And this is the evolution in quarter in terms of apparent steel consumption. Uh, in a nutshell, the latest figure available, which is Q4 2022, no surprise, the impact in terms of very poor demand of all the um, disruptions for the industry, high energy prices, low consumer confidence, uh, uh, industrial in supply chain issues for the industry. So it all, it all translated in, uh, in the second lowest level in apparent consumption on record. Uh, the second lowest levels after Q2 2020, 2020 which was impacted by, by the pandemic. Uh, the peak to trough correction from the, the previous cycle, which was the very robust, robust rebound in 2021, uh, was a correction of minus 27%. But in, in any case, um, our view is that uh, Q4 2022 should represent the lowest point of the cycle, and we should have some a bit modest short-term improvement over the next few quarters. But um, as we said, we had largely anticipated that Q4 would have been a very, very uh, difficult time for um, for the steel industry in terms of demand. Uh, and uh, we, we have the data that now confirm our, our assumption. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, uh, which is an expansion of what we've seen in the previous slide. So here we have... Uh, growth rates in apparent consumption over over in different quarters, uh, and also we introduce here uh, something on trade. We present the evolution of imports in in, in different quarters in terms of year on year growth rates. So in a nutshell, the the, the main points are that uh, as we've seen already, we had a slowdown in demand from the very strong rebound in 2021. A slowdown in demand, which continued um, up to Q1 2022, and then demand started feel started feeling impacted by the by the war and other ongoing issues such as energy prices and the deterioration of the industrial outlook. So, um, apparent consumption went to negative territory already in Q2 2022, a minus five percent, and then. Um, drops were even more severe in the two subsequent quarters, minus 11% in Q3 and minus 19% in Q4. And in annual terms, uh, this has resulted in a recession of minus 7% in apparent in consumption in 2022. Um, we already had recession in 2019 and 2020 due to COVID, and then we had, uh, we had seen a, a a rather strong rebound of 16% in 2021, which was just, I would say, uh, more a, a, a simple rebound from the very, very low levels seen in 2020. And real consumption, which is apparent consumption adjusted by the stock cycle, grew marginally in 2022 uh, at a lower rate than SWIP, which was 0.3%. In our latest outlook, which was published in early May, uh, we see um, another recession in 2023 in apparent consumption, albeit more moderate than in, in 2022, which is minus 1%, uh, which will be followed by 5.4% growth in 2024. Um, and a few words on imports. Interestingly, imports um, obviously have dropped in Q4 as a reflection of very weak demand by 32%. But if you look at what happened in the previous quarters, you see that in, um, growth in imports have constantly um, outperformed growth in apparent consumption. So as a result, the share of imports out of the share of imports out of apparent consumption has remained around high levels, that is 24% uh, in Q4 22. Uh, if we go to the next slide, which is yeah, uh, as a result of these developments in, in trade, you see here the annual evolution of um, steel trade balance for the entire EU for finished steel products. And the main point here is that uh, the EU, as you see, has, has almost become an, a structural net importer of finished steel products. We had con six consecutive years of trade deficit that has been widening in 21 and 22. So you see there. 
uh, deficit has widened over the last two years and we had six consecutive years of deficit. Um, so uh, we go to the next slide. We, we can then uh, introduce our brief section on on a policy issue which is becoming increasingly important in the EU and also outside the EU, which is CBAM. What is CBAM? CBAM is an acronym for Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Um, you probably know it is a unique carbon price-based measure um, that has been um, set out by the EU alone. Uh, and no other economic region has planned any measure like that. The EU is really the first mover, uh, and it is... Uh, um, expected to be implemented, will start being implemented in, in 2026 and will gradually replace the existing emission trading scheme, ETS, which you know uh, is based on, on, on uh, CO2 allowances, which are free for um, energy intensive industries like the steel or the cement industry, uh, which receive free allowances, so have no carbon costs, don't have to purchase uh, these uh, uh, CO2 allowances. But the ca carbon border adjustment, the CBAM will replace after 2026 uh, ETS. Uh, so how does it work actually? So uh, I will try to explain to recap what's the, wh uh, what is intended to be put in place. So um, CBAM is targeted to companies. So um, will not target um, countries or let alone, uh, uh, let's say, companies for the sake of being companies, but we'll focus essentially or entirely on goods. So the content of carbon in goods, for example, seed products or whatever uh, whatever other sector is in the scope of CBAM. Um, and companies will have to obviously pay CBAM, will have to pay a levy. Uh, at the border uh, by taking into account some criteria and uh, and merits, which are essentially these three, according to the latest CBAM version, which is now um, in uh, has been approved by the the European Parliament and European Council, uh, which is the uh, the actual carbon content of the imported goods, uh, the level of free allowances there are uh, in the in the EU ETS uh, market. Uh, and the carbon price, which is effectively paid in the country of production of the imported goods. So, um, in a nutshell, this is based on on a very simple principle, which is called equal carbon prices, equal carbon pricing. That's to say that um, you know EU businesses currently pay a carbon price in you know, order to have the allowance to uh, to 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 emit. CO2 uh, based on their production, on an actual production in the EU. Uh, importers will need to pay a carbon adjustment, which is equal to the price that they would have paid if uh, those goods had been produced under the EU's carbon pricing rules of the ETS. So the CBAM charge will reflect actually the EU, et EU ETS free allowances that are allocated to the EU uh, produce um, production in the sectors which are in the scope of the CEPA. Um, the consequence is that there is no double pricing, that's the objective, means that no, if a non EU producer can show that they have already paid a carbon price for the production of imported goods in a third country, that amount will be deducted for the EU importance. So no good will pay a double, will, will be charged with a double pricing. That's the philosophy. Uh, if we go to the next slide, this is uh, in a nutshell the timeline um, from now on to 2026 when the implementation will start. And uh, uh, now we will see that's really the challenge where the implementation will start, how it will be set out in detail, how it will be um, implemented. So now we have a, a, a CBAM uh, um, structure a proposal that has been approved by the European Parliament and the Council, uh, which uh, more or less covers some uh, industrial sectors and some some scope of industrial production. Um, so we, now we have the phasing um, the phasing in, let's say, this year to allow businesses to um, get confident with this with this tax with this mechanism and to adjust. Then the transitional phase will start in October this year and will last until December 2025, when uh, uh, monitoring and reporting implementing rules for importance will be um, finalized in detail and set out in detail by the CBAM committee at the EU level. Then in 2025, we will have the so-called review, where the scope extension will be defined in full detail 
will be finalized. So all the sectors that are included in the CBAM will be defined. And also, we will uh, have decisions on what to do with indirect emissions. Will they be included in the CBAM or not? And what will happen with exports? Will how they will be counted in the CBAM? Will they be included or not? This is also something which will have to be defined. And then we will have the post-transitional phase from January 2026, when the actual implementation will start. And then we will also have, together with this uh, uh, implementation, the phasing out of the uh, ETS and of fee allocation. So fee allocation will be gradually removed together with the start of implementation of the CBAM. If we go to the next slide, here we see as, as Eurofair, as a European Steel Association, European Steel Industry, what are our major concerns and what is our view in terms of, you know, what should be done in order to make the CBAM successful uh, and to be, um, you know, and, and, and not to, uh, in order to be something which will not uh, cause major disruptions in the, in the, in the trade, uh, system and in the in the overall industry, mm -hmm. we we believe that we should see a very cautious approach in the uh, phasing out of free allocation for CBAM sectors. Uh, so the CBAM will need to be properly tested before replacing free allocation. So uh, bearing in mind that the transitional period of 2023-2025 is not a real test period, since it is worth reminding that during that period no CBAM label will be applied, so importers will not have to pay anything until the implementation will start in January 2026. But in our view, a fast uh, free allocation phase out uh, should be avoided because it would expose the EU industry to very high carbon costs because we would have to pay uh, you know, to, to get CO2 allowances to permits to emit CO2 in a context where uh, the industrial outlook is already a very uncertain and it is expected to possibly continue to be impacted by uncertain developments in energy prices. So uh, we would ask, let's say, to be somewhat protected against this risk. Uh, and also uh, the EUC sector, you know, is committed to invest massively uh, in decarbonization projects uh, with a view to the objective of full decarbonization of the EU industry by 2050. So the CBAM in this respect is also a decarbonization tool, is also an instrument which uh, is instrumental to achieve the EU's environmental targets and should also be used by, as, by industries as a way to uh, speed up their decarbonization process. But um, during this transition period, which will obviously will, will be costly because we will have to um, invest a lot of money to decarbonize, uh, it will be important to be protected uh, um, against the, the risk of having to pay uh, CO2 allowances. So we need a complementarity between CBAM and free location, as I said. Um, and if we go to the next slide, then in the end, it's also very important that this, uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, please. It is important that this uh, complementarity and this, uh, um, let's say, gradual transition is maintained because um, another key objective, another key point is that the initial levy uh, that uh, importers will have to pay when the CBAM will be introduced will be will have to be low uh, in order not to create trade disruptions and in order not to uh, let's say, not to uh, uh, create a potential distortion of trade flows, uh, and also in order to facilitate, obviously, and to ease trade relations between the EU and the rest of the world. So we believe that um, at least until um, the effective, full effectiveness of CBAN is proven and during the transition period, um, uh, free allocation should be maintained and 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 uh, uh, and the the price in any case uh, paid by importers should uh, reflect actually uh, the price paid by uh, eu domestic producers to uh, to to produce uh, uh, to 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 emit a co2 um should not this solution not be possible so if uh, the eu institution should conclude that it is not possible to grant free allocations to energy intensive industries we would very much support the phasing out of free allowances uh, uh, 
for a longer period, which is uh, uh, to extend the duration of the of the of the, of the phasing out uh, from 2006 to at least uh, 2020, 2035, so as to allow um, in the industry to uh, uh, to bear the the cost burden of 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 CO2 allowances at least with some reduction of, of course after 2030. But that's that's our policy ask, and that's how we see it. So in essential, so essentially. Uh, we do believe that a CBAM should not be uh, a penalizing measure for importers or something which should uh, disrupt trade flows. On the contrary, uh, we think it should be based on a, on, on a fair principle of, uh, of, let's say, reflection of, 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 a, pre, of a price paid by the EU producers internally. Uh, so we should not externalize this price to 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 trade uh, to uh, third country um, produce goods uh, uh, and uh, should not penalize importers to let's say uh, in order to ensure a smooth transition to full implementation of CBAM, which however remains as I said um, to be fully defined because some technical details still have to be uh, seen and we will see it in, uh, in uh, during 2025 uh, the the scope uh, um, the definition of of, of, of uh, exports uh, and the regime the regime of exports and also indirect emissions so um, there's a lot to do still but we think we we we, we more or less as as you refer we 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 are convinced that some of uh, uh, some criteria should be maintained and some of the of uh, the main lines should be uh, clear ahead of us and these are the conclusions which i won't repeat um just to maybe two additional points in the end the last two points uh which are two other uh, longer term challenges for the EU steel industry which i haven't uh, uh, mentioned in my presentation. Uh, one is the US IRA, which is something which uh, is worrying to some extent for the European seed industry because, you know, it um, grants uh, a massive uh, amount of subsidies for US industries versus non use uh, industries. And also uh, it provides preferential treatment to US steel versus European steel. So there are lots of factors which might. Uh, impact the consumption of uh, European steel on the U.S. market. The U.S. are a country with which the EU has a trade surplus. So this is something interesting, important for us. And second point is that we 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 have seen in the last two years uh, long some decline in steel intensity. That's to say that um, real consumption grows less than sweep. So it means uh, that uh, every additional unit of Industrial production contains uh, less steel in, in a nutshell, and this is um, something worrying. We need to see whether this is a longer term trend or just a temporary thing, but we will see it. So uh, this is all from me. Thank you very much indeed for your, your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Shamrulli. Uh, that was indeed a very detailed uh, presentation, including the expected CBAM impact and what are the developments uh, that we have been hearing. So really, thank you so much uh, for that. I think uh, we can take a couple of questions before we uh, wrap up uh, the session. So uh, probably one thing that uh, I wanted to know from you is that how do you see the steel import quotas uh, especially like uh, we have been hearing that in the quarter one of 2023, these steel imports have been really slow and quotas mm. for most of the products and origins were filled very slowly with lots of volumes remaining unsold. So uh, how is the scenario currently and uh, what is your near-term outlook? Well, on the quarter, on the quarter legislation, I... What I can say is, um, I, I think I don't find it a, a very surprising what you said because, well, for two reasons. First is that there's a kind of seasonal pattern, so that uh, the first the first quarter of each year, we've always seen uh, uh, quite low uh, utilization rates of quarters in the past few years. Uh, secondly, I think this is very much uh, still in correlation with very weak demand. So. Um, I would also put it in this context, I would say. So demand is, is, is Q, we don't have yet the data for Q1 2023, but we expect problems to remain quite low. Yes. I see. And uh, going forward uh, in uh, the next quarter or uh, for 2023, uh, do you see the imports to remain on the lower side? 
Um, mm, I can't say that. Um, I, I, I have no strong, I don't have strong views on that. We see a lot okay. of, uh, as we always do, we always see a lot of uh, volatility in monthly figures. So um, it, we should have the full spectrum, the full range of, of quarterly figures uh, up to at least April this year uh, to see a trend. Um, but I would expect, I would expect, however, um, some growth in imports in 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 in, uh, in over the last three three months. Yes, uh, yes, but still remaining. Uh, they say still remaining around the market share, which was uh, was seen in Q4 2020, 2022. So no big changes compared to the previous picture. So. I see. And uh, we have been recently hearing about some of the steel production cuts by the domestic mills in Europe. So how, how does the situation currently? Oh, yes, we, um, I mean, this is something which has been widely reported by the press, I guess, over the next, over the last months. Particularly in the second half of 2022, we had some, quite some capacity idling or capacity reduction. In you, some blast furnace were idled, but then we've seen some quite, um, I would not say considerable, but some improvement over the last few months. So some mills were restarted, um, but yet um, capacity utilization remains rather low, which means that if we have an increase in demand, then uh, we will see a ramp up in production. So mills will be able to to increase the capacity utilization rates, as we've seen already in 2021, when the, the pandemic ended. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Sakina, over to you for the question. Yeah. Uh, so what is your outlook on flat steel prices for Europe, both domestic yeah. and imports, and what are the factors driving it? Oh, thanks for thanks for the question. Uh, unfortunately, I I'm not allowed to answer questions on forecasts of seal prices. We have quite some severe EU competition rules, which um, let's say forbid uh, you know <laughs> making forecasts in public events on 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 seal prices. But I can say very broadly that uh, usually uh, seal prices anticipate uh, future developments in 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 demand. Uh, so market they reflect market sentiment and the expectation of of, of demand in the in the, in the next uh, in the next few months. So uh, what we see we see now still prices still at low levels, but this is I think very very in, in, in a reflection of demand of weak demand. But I can't say more than that. Sorry. All right, uh, Mr. Shamarini, there is one question from the audience uh, regarding the guidelines of CBAM. So is mm -hmm. there any update on the detailed guideline of CBAM, uh, which was expected to be out somewhere in June, July or so? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, th I think something, something should be released in October this year. I would not expect anything before that. I see. Um, no, I'm not aware of this, no. Okay. So I think uh, that was the last question that uh, we could accommodate in this session. Uh, for those whose queries have remained unanswered, do write us separately and uh, we'll try our best to get your questions answered uh, from our esteemed guest. Hope you all enjoyed the webinar as we did. And a very warm thank you to Mr. Shamarli for your time and your valuable inputs on the topic. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you, Sakina. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sakina, for joining in. Uh, before we end this webinar, a reminder to join us tomorrow for the next webinar, which is on impact of power prices and duties on Indian manganese alloys market. I am Nishtha Mukherjee signing out of this webinar. Thank you, everyone.